Hi, boys and girls, Mrs. Sadowski here again. So, how are you enjoying By the Great Horn Spoon so far? I know we've only just begun, right? But I love this book and it gets me so excited about the Gold Rush study. So, are we ready for chapter two? Now, remember, Jack and Praiseworthy, they've been shoveling coal and all is going well because. It's been cold outside. So they're by a nice warm furnace as they're shoveling the coal in. They've got this fire going. They've been toasty warm. Now, let's see if we can catch their thief. So here we go. Two, how to catch a thief. After many days, like a dog after rain, the Lady Wilma shook winter from her masts and riggings. She entered the southern latitudes. The sun came out bright and fresh as if newly forged, and the nights were speckled over with stars. The fires went out in the pot-bellied stoves, and the passengers began to shed their greatcoats and heavy woolens. In another week, they were down to their shirt sleeves. In the lower regions of the ship, Praiseworthy and Jack were still at their shovels. They were powdered over with coal dust, but Jack did not mind the work. It would toughen him for digging in the gold fields, he thought. Still, the roaring flames had lost their friendliness. The boiler room was becoming distinctly overheated. Oh, yeah. Master Jack, said Praiseworthy, thinking of the tropic zones that lay ahead. Another week at our post, and we shall be roasted alive. But the heat did not bother Jack, for every turn of the paddle wheels brought the far country a bit closer. Even though the sea route was the long way around, it was faster than the overland trail across the plains. The ox-drawn wagon trains were sometimes a year in reaching California, and Jack was in a hurry. Every day counted. It was fine with him that Captain Swain was making a race around the horn. The captain was in a hurry, too. Still, it would be months before the Lady Wilma dropped anchor in San Francisco Bay. There would hardly be time enough to complete the voyage, reach the mines, make a fortune, and return to Boston before Aunt Arabella had to sell everything. But try they must. This infernal firebox, Praiseworthy said, wiping the sweat from his face. We must think of a plan. We must expose the rogue who light-fingered our passage money. The truth of the matter was that neither Jack nor the butler had the slightest idea how to go about catching a thief. But Praiseworthy was undaunted. They would surely think of something. Meanwhile, they fed the flames, strengthened their backs, toughened their hands, and slept on deck under a balmy sky. In their free time, they washed in buckets of seawater, and Jack began a letter home. He had no idea when or where he would mail it, but Praiseworthy had packed pen and paper and had no intention of allowing Jack to forget his duties. But I would avoid any direct mention of our temporary misfortune, said the butler with a wink. No point in worrying your Aunt Arabella, even for a moment. Finding a shady spot under a lifeboat, Jack spread out his writing materials and began. Dear Aunt Arabella, Dear Constance, dear Sarah, by this time you have found my note on the tea service and learned that Praiseworthy and I have joined the gold rush to California. I am writing this at sea. Please do not worry as we are well and happy and getting plenty of good exercise. Our ship is the Lady Wilma and we are racing the Sea Raven to San Francisco. But at the moment we don't know whether we are ahead or behind as our ships became separated in the bad weather. But now, the sky is as blue as it can get. It is hard to remember that you are still having winter back in Boston. I go barefoot. Praiseworthy says we will soon be seeing the Southern Cross in the sky. I am getting used to the food. We have salt beef and sea biscuits, which are very filling. For dessert, we have dandy funk which is molasses pudding, or plum duff, which is just about what it sounds like. You would be very proud of me, Aunt Arabella, as I eat everything. Praiseworthy wants to be sure to be remembered. We are partners. We intend to come sailing back to Boston in a year. We will be rich as can be. The ship is 
very crowded. Everyone is anxious to get to California before the gold is gone. We see other ships on the sea almost every day. They are all California bound. I think it is going to be very crowded in the gold fields. I will tell you about some of our passengers. There is a horse doctor with a wooden leg. There is a judge with a scar over his eye. He rolls his own cigars and carries a sword cane. They say the mark over his eye is a dueling scar. We have several soldiers who fought in Mexico. They call themselves Mexico fighters and spend most of their time telling stories about the war. They are high-spirited and always laughing. I meant to mention that we have live animals aboard. They will provide fresh meat during the voyage. We have crates of chickens, a sow, and three pigs, two sheep, and one head of beef. I have made friends with the smallest pig and named him Good Luck for Good Luck. Praiseworthy says pigs are very smart. It seems strange not to be in school, but I am learning things every day. I will leave this letter unfinished and take up my pen again as adventures befall. The following day toward dusk, Jack was washing up in a bucket of seawater when Praiseworthy was struck as if by lightning. Master Jack, you have it. Had what? Answered Jack, looking up. He had had good luck with him in the boiler room, and now even the pig was covered with coal dust. Why, the answer? The answer? The answer to what? Praiseworthy's eyebrows shot up with delight. We'll catch the thieving scoundrel at last. You've hit it, Master Jack. You have indeed. Jack couldn't think what he hit, but the next thing he knew, he was following Praiseworthy like a squirrel up one ladder and then another to the pilot house. Captain Swain turned and gave the two intruders a weather-beaten squint. His temper, if not the growl of his voice, had improved with the weather. How is the blasted voyage agreeing with you, my hearties? No complaint, sir. What brings you about decks? You may recall that Master Jack and I suffered a slight misfortune at the very outset of this voyage. Some blasted, uh, that is to say, some despicable thief made off with our funds. Master Jack here has hit upon a scheme to expose the rascal. Me? Ah, uh, I don't believe there's any such scamp aboard my ship. I asked the first mate to make a close examination of our passenger list. Gentlemen they are, most of them, and the others are too crude for the clever arts of the cut purse. Nevertheless, I believe he's among your passengers like a fox among sheep. Allow us to prove it. Captain Swain scratched through his dark whiskers. How do you figure on exposing him? We won't expose him, sir. He'll expose himself. If you will have all the passengers assembled in the main saloon after dark, we'll know very soon whether or not you have a clever thief aboard. By crabs, it's worth a try. When the sea turned black, the whale oil lamps were lit in the main saloon, and the passengers began to gather. They joked and joshed, glad for something to do, for they were not used to the idleness of life at sea. Jack waited on deck with the black sow from the animal pens. He saw the horse doctor enter on his peg leg, followed by the judge smoking one of his homemade cigars. The ex-soldiers were singing, I'm going to California with my washbowl on my knee. When all the passengers were assembled, the captain made a grand entrance, puffing on a twisted black cigar, and with his long coat flapping almost to his knees. Gentlemen, I'll get to the point. I am told there may be a thief among us, a cut purse. We can't have that now, can we? No! Roared out the gold seekers, giving their purses and money belts a reassuring touch. We'll string him up! yelled a big fellow known as Mountain Jim. He had full red eyebrows and wore a bobcat cap. The captain held up a hand to stop the voices. This cut purse has already struck, gentlemen. He lifted the savings of Mr. Praiseworthy and his young partner. You've seen them working off their passage at the coal bunkers. The thief may strike again. Any one of you may be his next victim. He may be standing at your elbow. 
I'll now turn the meeting over to the aforementioned persons who have a plan to capture the scoundrel. Praiseworthy, tall and calm, stepped forward. Thank you, Captain Sway. Our plan is very simple, gentlemen. Master Jack, the sow, if you please. At that signal, Jack led the big black hog to the center of the saloon and tied her to a post. The men began to exchange baffled glances. What had a large sow to do with catching a thief? But if there was a thief among them, they wanted him caught. Their own purses weren't safe with a light-fingered fellow aboard. A pig is a smart animal, praiseworthy explained. None smarter, yelled out Mountain Jim. Take this old sow. She's very wise. We've discovered that she can tell a dishonest man by the mere feel of him. She squeals. Gentlemen, you can't even tell a simple lie in her presence. She'll squeal every time. A most remarkable hog, I must say. Jack looked about at the many faces shining under the flickering wheel oil lamps. There were the horse doctor and the Mexico fighters and the judge with his sword cane. Not even Mountain Jim with his fur cap was above suspicion. Jack fed the black sow a limp carrot to keep her quiet, but he began to feel anxious. What if praiseworthy was wrong and the thief wasn't aboard the Lady Wilma at all? I assure you, praiseworthy was saying, that if the cut purse so much as touches this hog, she will squeal. If you will line up, gentlemen, we'll get on with it. After the lamps are blown out and the saloon is dark, come up to the sow one by one. Touch her with your right index finger. When she squeals, we'll have our thief. I'm for it, one of the ex-soldiers said. Me too. A good plan, said the judge. Suits me, agreed the horse doctor, turning on his peg leg. Some of you boys get the lamps. Let's see how smart this hog is. If you're an honest man, you've got nothing to fear. A moment later, the saloon was in pitch darkness, and Jack held himself very still, feeding carrots to the animal so she wouldn't squeal. One by one, the gold seekers approached and ran a finger along the sow's back. A minute passed. Two. Not a sound from the hog. The passengers scuffed across the deck in their boots, touched the hog, and retired. The men were silent, listening for the squeal that would trap the guilty man. Ten minutes passed, and still they came. Even Praiseworthy felt a bit tense now. When finally the whale oil lamps were relit, the black sow hadn't uttered a sound. She stood in the center of the saloon, wondering what all the fuss was about. Captain Swain stepped forward, scratching his beard as he looked about at his passengers, and then turned to Praiseworthy. Looks like you made a mistake. That cut purse isn't aboard this ship. I, Krabs, I'm sorry about you and the lad there, but it looks like you'll be shoveling coal all the way around the Horn to California. One moment, said Praiseworthy, as unconcerned as you please. It's true, the sow didn't squeal. But the guilty party stands in this room, sir. Gentlemen, Master Jack and I took the liberty of powdering this black sow with coal dust. If each of you will now examine your right index finger where you touched her hide, you will find a smudge. Every man in the saloon instantly turned up his hand, and there indeed was the smudge of black dust. Praiseworthy didn't waste a moment, but one of you... Fearing that the sow's squeal would give you away, one of you approached, but didn't touch a finger to her back. Look around you, gentlemen. If there is a man among you without coal dust on his finger, he has exposed himself as the thief. Almost at once, there was an outcry from one corner of the saloon. We got him! Passengers, suddenly angry, crowded around, and Jack couldn't see who they had pounced upon. We'll string him up. Look there! His finger's clean as a whistle. It's the judge. Judge, my eye, he's an imposter. Jack burrowed through the crowd in time to see the judge attempt to draw his sword cane. But the Mexico fighters jumped in and pinned his arms back. By the time the ship's officers got hold of the frock-coated imposter, his hat was caved in and the cigar hung in shreds from his mouth. Now the crowd opened up 
and Jack had never seen praiseworthy was such a fierce look in his eye. I suppose we'll find the balance of our money in your cabin, sir. Try to find it, spat the thief, peering from Jack to praiseworthy and back again. Clever you are, but we'll meet again. I warn you, or my name's not Cut Eye Higgins. Humbug, said Praiseworthy just as sharply. The miners had their own ideas of justice, and the suggestions went flying around the saloon. Pitch him overboard and let him swim to California. String him or put him in iron. But Captain Swain already had his mind made up. Take him to the coal bunkers. By the time we cross the equator, by grabs he'll think he's in Hades. All righty. So they find the thief, right? And it was the judge. Who would think that a judge would commit such a crime? But do you think he's really a judge? Or is he just pretending to be? Did you also notice all the different words they used for a thief? A cut purse, light fellowed finger, um, or light feathered, light feathered finger, something like that. Um, lots of different words, lots of synonyms for a thief. And then by the end, it says, take him to the coal bunkers. By the time we cross the equator by grabs, he'll think he's in Hades. Do you know what Hades is? Hades is the underworld. Another word for it is a word that a lot of people don't like to use. And that word is hell. Um, so they're saying basically that if he gets sent to the coal bunkers and has to shovel the coal when they get to the equator. Remember, I talked to you guys about the map, right? And as we travel farther down on our route and we get closer to where the equator comes through, it's going to be really hot. And the last place that you're going to want to be when it's really hot is shoveling coal in a coal bunker because that would be really miserable and you would feel like you were on fire and all that heat and it would feel like you were in Hades. All right, so let's get to work here. Our main job, of course, is to come up with our storyboard, right? And we're working on storyboard summaries. So I'm just going to grab my keyboard, so don't mind me as I fumble with my limited space and my technology here. So today's looks like this. And on the second page, we have chapter two. Now, when you see it, it's going to be filled in because that's what we're going to do right now. And I'm going to move my little picture over here. And we are going to type our summary together. Now, will I do this every single time with you? No, absolutely not. But for the first few, we teachers felt like it was a good idea to do some together and to give you some good models of what we're expecting. So remember, the summary, the very first sentence of this needs to be the overall idea. One sentence, what was this chapter about? So if we think, you know, we have them, you know, talking and they're shoveling coal and, you know, it's starting to get a little warmer and Jack writes a letter, um, but really, you know, it's titled How to Catch a Thief. And the whole plan that they come up with is all about the pig. Now, Praiseworthy says that Jack is the one who came up with it. But Jack has no clue what he's talking about. So really, who's the one who came up with the idea? Praiseworthy. But it was based on watching Jack with the pig good luck and noticing how the coal dust gets on him, but also on your fingers and things. So, you know, Praiseworthy. Great guy, right? He's giving all the credit to his master, Master Jack, even though he's just a little boy. Well, 12 years old, older than you guys are. Um, but even though he's just a minor, Praiseworthy is still giving him that credit. So really, it's all about their plan, right? So I'm going to say in this chapter, uh, Praiseworthy comes up with a plan to catch the thief oops, who stole his and Jack's money. Um, let's see. Do we want to mention the letter home? Is it key that he's writing to his aunt and telling her about their voyage? Might be important later doesn't seem super important to our overall thing. 
let's skip that part and we'll come back and revisit. So how did they come up with this plan? Well, while working in the coal bunkers, praiseworthy, notice the coal dust on the pig. Good luck. Cute name for a pig, right? He then asked Captain Swain to gather all the men in the, they said it was the saloon. Okay? That was the saloon part of the ship. And a saloon back then, you know, some people think of a saloon as just like a bar. Um, but a saloon also could be like a living space or an area where you would socialize. And so on a ship, your saloon is going to be more of like just the social area. So they gather in the saloon. Um, let me use the word next. Next, praiseworthy asks all the men to actually doesn't even tell them that the pig is going to swill tells the men that the pig will squeal if a dishonest person touches her he wants each man to come up and touch the pig while the lights are out. Jack feeds the pig so she will stay quiet. When the lights come back on, the judge has a clean finger so they all know he is the thief. Uh, Captain Swain sends him to work in the coal bunkers. Move my little text box so they don't have any problems with the word showing. All right, let's see if we like this. And here we go. In this chapter, Praiseworthy comes up with a plan to catch the thief who stole his and Jack's money. True. While working in the coal bunkers, Praiseworthy noticed the coal dust on the pig. Good luck. He then asked Captain Swain to gather all the men in the saloon. Next, Praiseworthy tells the men that the pig will squeal if a dishonest person touches her. He wants each man to come up and touch the pig while the lights are out. Jack feeds the pig so she will stay quiet. When the lights come back on, the judge has a clean finger so they all know he is the thief. Captain Swain sends him to work in the coal bunkers. All right, I think we have captured the key events. Definitely wasn't room in here to mention Jack writing a letter. And honestly, I mean, yeah, it was in there and it's passing the time, but it's not a key event, so we can leave it out. Now it's picture time. We've got to put a picture in here. So again, I can go to insert image and I scroll down to search the web. Unless you happen to have a picture saved on your device at home, that would be perfect for this. And let's see, we're using a pig. So pig might be a good thing. Um, otherwise a thief. I think I'm going to look for a black Pig. Black pig. On a boat. Never know. Maybe there will be one. Mm. Doesn't seem to be a black pig on a boat. So let's get rid of the on a boat. I'm just going to look for a black pig. And... Hmm. Which one do I like the most? A lot of cute ones. I think probably best if it doesn't look like the pig is on grass because we're on a boat right now, right? I think we'll go with this guy. So I'm going to put 
this one. And of course, you might disagree with me. You might think, oh, nope, we should use a different one. Where did my image go? Oh, it says it's creating images. Sorry. Apparently, my internet wants to run a little slow right now. Well, it's having a hard time with that one. All right, we'll try again. Insert, search the web, black pig. So it didn't like that one. So we'll just choose a different one. Maybe I could use this one. There we go. All right, and I think this image is a little too big, so I'm gonna make it smaller. And I'm gonna drag it right here. And maybe I'll make it a little smaller again. And there we go. There's my black pig. It looks like we drew him right on the page. Okay, so your task now, in just a moment, you're gonna go to this original one. And once I'm done making the video, down here, it'll say chapter two, that's how you got to see me just now. And then I'll say chapter three. So once we're done with this video, you're gonna click on chapter three. You'll get to hear the story being read, follow along in your book. And then your task is to go ahead and do the summary and the picture today for chapter three. Remember your job, think about overall, what is the chapter about? And also think, hmm, what are those key events? All right, boys and girls, let's see how you do with the next one.